Thanks, Kaylee. Um, first of all, let me just ask, how many of you have um, been to Slovakia by a show of hands and speak the language? Very good. Great. Well, welcome. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce His Excellency Peter Burian, who was appointed uh, Slovakian Ambassador to the United States in 2008. He has worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1993 in various uh, directorial and ambassadorial positions, including the Director of Policy Planning and Analysis and Head of Slovakia's Mission to NATO in Brussels. Uh, prior to that, he'd been Director, Director General for Human Dimension Affairs, as well as the Secretary and eventually Chargé d'Affaires at the Slovak Embassy in Washington, D.C. In 1987, he headed the Czechoslo uh, Czechoslovak Embassy in Beirut, Lebanon, as Chargé d'Affaires. He also completed his formal education at the Diplomatic Academy in Moscow, Russia, having studied at the Institute of International Relations School of Law at Comenius University School of Law in Bratislava, and in the Department of Oriental Studies at St. Petersburg State University in Russia. During that time in Russia, he attended a study program at the University of Cairo, which helps to explain uh, his proficiency in many languages, including English, French, Russian, and Arabic. Prior to his position as ambassador to the United States, he served as ambassador to, and permanent representative of Slovakia to the United Nations in New York. Today, he will be speaking to us on Slovakia, a success story of transformation and integration. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Peter Burian. <clears throat> Good morning and thank you for this nice welcome and introduction and I'm really very happy to be here uh, this morning and I would like to uh, thank the uh, university for the invitation to come to Utah and for organizing a rich uh, program of my three-day visits. This is my actually first visit to Utah as, uh, in my capacity as ambassador of Slovakia to um, Washington and based on what I've heard and what I've seen and read, I, I'm uh, almost sure that it's not the last one and we had a wonderful meeting this morning with the Lieutenant Governor uh, of, of Utah and we agreed that Slovakia and Utah have many uh, similar features. Uh, they both, uh, both have wonderful nature, they both uh, have great skiing opportunities, they both are oriented to knowledge-based economy and this is our uh, priority uh, too and uh, they uh, finally are famous for their hospitality and I'm only naming uh, several of, of the features which, uh, which bring us to uh, together. The, the Lieutenant Governor said that um, he considers Utah as an in uh, undiscovered place and I think Slovakia is in a similar position because many times when you are uh, driving from Prague to Budapest, you just passed Bratislava, but I'm glad that uh, Bratislava is becoming uh, finally a destination also for tourists and, and, and uh, people doing business and, and, and so on. That's why I think also this visit uh, will generate many ideas and identify areas where we can work together for the benefit of our, our, our two countries. And second, I would like to commend your university for establishing Utah Ambassador Lecture Series program, enabling interaction and establishment of uh, direct contacts between the diplomatic community in Washington, your faculty, students, and also uh, people from business community and state administration. The direct communication, I believe, and interaction between people is the best way to strengthen mutual understanding of problems facing us all and to strengthen global cooperation in addressing the challenges of 21st century. And I have to say we Slovak understand and cherish the possibility of this kind of interaction and communication after being isolated and divided for almost 50 years from our friends and partners on the other side of the Iron Curtain, including our relatives and friends in the United States. And here I want to say that um, probably you might know, you might not know, that almost every family in Slovakia has a relative in the United States and there are almost two million 
Americans with uh, Slovak roots, so it's really a major um, community. And uh, sometimes in the history, uh, I was just joking that Pittsburgh used to be the biggest Slovak city. <laughs> but I would like to come back to the subject of my, my, my lecture. And uh, yesterday, it has been exactly 21 years since the Velvet Revolution in former Czechoslovakia, which removed these cruel and inhuman barriers and opened the way for our freedom and democracy we enjoy today. So I believe it would be most appropriate today to share with you the story of our transformation and integration, which started exactly 21 years ago on the squares of Prague and Bratislava. Back on November 16th, 1999, in the nowadays capital city of Slovakia, Bratislava, Slovak high school and university students organized a peaceful demonstration in the old center of Bratislava. This is believed to be a trigger point that gave birth to later events of much grander scales in the whole country on November 17th. And uh, you probably know these events were called Velvet Revolution, but we in Slovakia call it also Gentle uh, Revolution. And both terms were picked to describe the same uh, unique non-violent mass people's movement that have helped to bring down a totalitarian communist regime in our country at the time in a peaceful way. The communist government broadly defied, discredited, and lacking support from the former Soviet Union had no choice but to dissolve soon after. And by December 28, we had a new president. He was Czech, Václav Havel. He was elected as the first democratic president after, World War, uh, after, after this period of communism. And a Slovak, Alexander Dubček, the iconic face of uh, suppressed by Soviet tanks reformist movement in 1968 uh, became the chair of the Federal Assembly, which is our parliament. And I, I have to say that really nobody believed that uh, the fall of communism can happen so fast and uh, without the major uh, bloodshed, of course, there was violence on the street, but uh, more or less everything went quite peacefully, also because of the discipline and, and really very cultivated approach of, of people who wanted to get rid of, of the uh, communist regime without a feeling of revenge. Velvet or Gentle Revolution of 1999 brought Czechoslovakia back to the family of European democracies, back to its original values on, each, uh, on, on which it was established after World War I in 1918 by our founding fathers, by President Masaryk and Minister Stefanik, also Czech and Slovak, with the strong, uh, strong support of President Woodrow Wilson. As I have already mentioned, it has been 21 years already since the fall of Iron Curtain in Central and Eastern Europe. And I have to say that really today uh, a new generation has difficulties to imagine that there was time in our recent history when people simply were not able to visit neighboring Austria, which is really behind the corner, and that uh, people were prosecuted for their views simply for meeting friends uh, from Western countries. And today, Slovakia is a democratic and prosperous country fully integrated into European and transatlantic stru structures. It is a NATO and EU member, and we are part of Schengen and Eurozone. We are OECD uh, member and uh, member of other, uh, other important clubs and organizations. People can uh, benefit from free movement throughout Europe without passports, and they uh, can choose where they want to work and live. And this was really uh, only a wild dream uh, 20 years ago. Finally, uh, in November last year, we were included into a visa favor program, enabling our citizens visa-free traveling to the United States. And now we are uh, taking all those freedoms uh, and benefits of our democracy and integration for granted. But I believe it's, it's very important to remember and promote the events which led uh, to our freedom and realization of the vision of Europe 
whole and free and at peace, presented more than 20 years ago by President Bush 41 in Germany. Otherwise, the history might uh, repeat it itself. Uh, the vision of whole and free Europe has been a dream of many generations of people in Central and Eastern Europe. And I'm really lucky to be able to, to live this dream. At the same time, we do not have to forget that uh, this process is far from being completed. There are still some countries which are undergoing uh, the process of democratization and integration, or even countries like Belarus where people cannot en enjoy basic freedoms and human rights the same we do. That is why countries of Visegrad 4, which uh, cooperated very closely and supported each other in the period of our integration, they decided that uh, they have a duty um, to, to repay back or, uh, or to uh, help other countries which are undergoing this process of, of transformation and integration. And that's why we are also working together to help countries in uh, Western Balkans or uh, countries of former uh, Soviet Union to uh, actually go the same way and maybe taking the benefit of our experience. And in many ways, Slovakia and its success story can serve as an example or source of inspiration or motivation for those countries to undertake, uh, undertake sometimes very painful reforms to become full-fledged uh, part of the integrated and prosperous Europe. And I believe lessons learned and uh, good practices from our transformation, including the important role of civil society, can help others to move faster or uh, even avoid some mistakes when enacting reforms in their societies. Now I would like to say a few words about our um, experience from transformation and current economic situation in Slovakia. As you know, and uh, as it has been already mentioned, Slovakia emerged as an individual entity uh, after the split of Czechoslovakia in 1993. And as you also know, its birth was accompanied by several difficulties and daunting challenges. Uh, Slovakia, uh, in uh, difference with the Czech Republic, had to build all the state institutions from scratch. Uh, it had to build a new state and also at the same time start working on the integration. That's why really uh, this was a major challenge. And of course, not, not uh, uh, all the people were able uh, to understand the importance of severe cuts and uh, quite deep reforms, which were touching especially the uh, older generation. And that's why there was initial resistance to uh, some of the reforms. And uh, that's why we also initially had a more difficult government, which was close to semi-authoritarian uh, type of government, which was less inclined to adopt the measures we needed for our integration and for our democratizations. But we managed in 1999 uh, to elect a, a government which was a large coalition, and uh, this government started uh, radical reforms and changes in our society, and it, it's really truly remarkable what has happened and what we managed to achieve in such a short period of time. Uh, and you can imagine only a quarter uh, of a century ago, uh, Slovakia was the biggest tank producer in the region. Now, in 20 years after the fall of Iron Curtain, we succeeded to transform our engineering industry to one of the biggest producers of cars per capita in the world, and sometimes Slovakia is labeled as Detroit of Central Europe, but uh, hopefully not, not with all the problems Detroit uh, uh, had. And uh, really, we are able to, to avoid some of the problems Detroit uh, was facing also during the crisis, and I will come uh, back to that a little bit later. Entry of major car producers attracted the whole sector of car industry, and now Slovakia is one of the most competitive car manufacturers in the world. And if you take also uh, the comparison uh, in economy in terms of GDP, 
Within a few years, uh, our GDP per capita has grown from 4,000 US dollars to 22 thousand dollars at purchasing power parity in 2008, which is really a dramatic change. While reaching GDP per capita average level among EU countries was a very distant dream just a couple of, uh, of years ago, now we are much closer and we are reaching beyond 72%, which you might say it's still uh, quite a big gap, but, but really uh, we are moving quite, quite fast to the EU average. And uh, we are continuing uh, to catching up uh, with the rest of Europe very quickly. And Bratislava region has already reached the GDP per capita, which is uh, actually much higher than the EU average. As I have already mentioned, this rapid growth was possible due to quite radical economic and social and fiscal reforms that have also created very favorable conditions for investors such as US Steel, Volkswagen, Peugeot Citroën, Kia, Sony, Samsung and others to invest in Slovakia in, in 2007 and 2008. Uh, the, the amount of investments was reaching to 7 billion of US dollars and 2007 was the best year ever with 4.5 billion US dollar in FDIs. And uh, the production of cars reached almost 1 million cars a year. Now there are 120 US companies successfully uh, investing and doing business in Slovakia. And what is very good news, they are moving to uh, production and to uh, using technologies with uh, a higher sophistication. So uh, the, the recent additions uh, among the ranks of investors are IBM, Dell, Honey Honeywell, uh, Hewlett Packard, and uh, uh, they are bringing, as I mentioned, into Slovakia new technologies, and they are also benefiting from still quite affordable, but very skillful and highly educated labor force. Obviously, the current uh, global financial and economic crisis is having a deep impact also on our economy, but I dare to say that uh, it cannot reverse the process of um, uh, reform or uh, it cannot reverse the, the progress and erase this success story. In many ways, the previous reforms actually, uh, including the financial sector reform and social welfare system reform, have helped us to navigate through the crisis a little bit easier than um, uh, it was the situation in some of our neighboring countries. And one of the factors positively influencing our financial stability was also our inclusion into the Eurozone, uh, which helped us to avoid uh, rapid depreciation or, or um, turbulences of our uh, national currencies. And uh, when we are speaking about the investors also, it helped uh, us to get some additional investments. Let's say Volkswagen recently was deciding where to invest and where to open a new factory line, which will produce the smallest version of Volkswagen, which is called uh, the UP. You haven't seen it yet because it's coming in 2011. Uh, and it will create uh, 1,500 uh, uh, jobs in Slovakia. And they were deciding between Czech Republic and Slovakia. But uh, the, the, the fact that we had euro and that we had uh, this kind of uh, currency stability uh, was working in, in our favor. Uh, finally, this year, uh, our uh, economy started growing again, and uh, it's reaching almost 4%, which is the, the highest growth in uh, uh, almost all Europe. And by saying that, I do not want to say that there are no problems in Slovakia. Uh, we have quite a high unemployment, which is reaching 12%. We also have uh, quite a high, but not... Uh, uh, a deficit of public fi finances we cannot mani uh, manage, which is reaching to 8% of GDP. And uh, what is important, the current government, which was elected last June, is undertaking uh, very uh, tough measures uh, to, to contain uh, this kind of situation, to 
uh, decreased the, the uh, deficits uh, of uh, public finances to 3% by 2013, and you can imagine it's an enormous task because uh, they also want to be elected uh, again. So uh, it's important to say that this government is not reversing uh, the reforms. On the contrary, it is deepening them, including uh, which you uh, understand is a difficult task, healthcare reform. Uh, it is increasing the financial discipline, fighting corruption, making the public uh, procurement more transparent. We are for the first time uh, 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 including or, or uh, introducing uh, electronic uh, uh, auctions uh, in the procurement system which will provide for a very transparent uh, uh, selection process, and uh, I believe uh, this will help us also to, to save some money. And finally, it's en uh, enacting responsible governance uh, in, in our country. We uh, really believe that th this is the best way how to, how to secure the continuation of the uh, success story and uh, this is to keep being reliable and respect its uh, democratic country. Now I would like to say a few words about foreign policy and international engagement of Slovakia. And here also the economic performance of Slovakia and the success of transformation and integration helped our country to strengthen its international standing and also boost our self-confidence also on the international scene. And I have to say, uh, and I felt it uh, when we are in the Security Council, that the weight of Slovakia in international affairs became much bigger than its actual size. In several regions, Slovakia has uh, become an important peace facilitator and contributor, especially in Cyprus, in uh, the Western Balkans, pa in particular in Bosnia and Montenegro. And in those regions, Slovakia managed to, to uh, play the role of honest broker and facilitator of a dialogue leading to stabilization and conflict resolution or conflict prevention. Uh, especially uh, the story about uh, our involvement in Cyprus is little known, but uh, since uh, 20 years ago, we uh, opened our embassy for a dialogue between uh, Turkish and, uh, and Greek uh, Cypriot community to, to talk to each other in, uh, even in the most difficult uh, times. Uh, I hope really this dialogue finally will produce some, some results also in connection with the ambitions of Turkey to, to integrate into the European Union. And Slovakia is also very active there where we have uh, knowledge, where we understand uh, the region, and it's uh, in the countries of Eastern Partnership and, and Central Asia. And as I mentioned, this uh, international engagement was also, was also translated in our successful bid for UN Security Council membership in 2006 and 2007, when Slovakia was elected by 185 votes out of 191 at that time in the UN General Assembly. And I had the privilege to represent my country in the uh, Security Council for, for two years. And uh, for two years, we actively participated in the work of this body, considered the most important instrument for dealing with issues of international peace and security. And when entering the uh, Security Council, Slovakia has decided also what we know the best, and uh, this was our positive transformation exp experience and know-how as well as uh, comprehensive understanding of the complexities of uh, certain regions for contributing to resolution uh, of crisis situations. And I believe really this helped us to be an effective uh, member of this, of this body. Our interventions were listened, uh, especially in those areas like Georgia uh, and uh, Western Balkans with a big interest and with due respect. 
probably if you have some additional questions about our Security Council membership, which is quite uh, interesting also, uh, but it, it is a, a totally separate story. Uh, I just want to uh, give you some facts that we are, and I was, I was leading some important committees during our two years uh, term, which was uh, uh, a committee dealing with non-proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction so-called 1540 committee. Then I was uh, for a, a period of time uh, leading the North Korea sanction committee and we are working uh, very closely also with uh, my uh, uh, US colleague on reform of the Security Council in the area of uh, revision of mandates of the Security Council. And finally, uh, I was also chairing the, the working group on uh, on uh, reform of the of the working methods and documentation in the in the Security Council, we uh, brought up some important uh, topics for discussions like uh, security sector reform, which I believe really is a very uh, important uh, element of uh, the exit strategy for the UN. If you do not have uh, reliable security forces. Uh, then the UN or the international community uh, is always stuck uh, uh, in the crisis, uh, not being able to pass uh, the responsibility to the local government, uh, and this is uh, clear, uh, uh, clearly a situation in, uh, in Afghanistan. And finally, we also managed to launch uh, the discussion about the interaction of several international bodies uh, uh, within uh, the uh, international system to cooperate more closely and not to compete uh, in the area of fighting proliferation of weapons of uh, mass destruction to non-state actors. So this is briefly about our international uh, engagement. I uh, uh, do not want to avoid uh, a topic uh, which is very important uh, for us uh, sitting here, and is the relationship uh, with the United States. And uh, uh, I have to underline that uh, the United States remains uh, our strategic partner and ally. And uh, as I mentioned, we thank the United States uh, for the support and assistance in our integration and transformation processes. But we do not want to have a free ride in this kind of uh, partnership. In the recent history, we are able to confirm this by concrete deeds, whether it was by our contribution to K4 or operation in Iraq. Now we are together in Afghanistan and we increase our uh, contribution further. This uh, year it will reach 350 troops, which uh, for the size of Slovakia is quite a considerable uh, contribution and we are moving to more demanding tasks and removing our uh, caveats for uh, our troops being used uh, uh, by the commander uh, quite freely uh, without any restrictions in the operations which we hope also other partners within NATO will, will do. Uh, so this very close uh, relationship and this closeness of uh, views and opinions was also uh, reflected recently in uh, our conversations when our new foreign minister, Mr. Zurinda, was here and, and he met with Hillary Clinton. They, they agreed uh, that this partnership is, is really very productive, very fruitful, and bringing uh, concrete, concrete uh, results. And uh, recently, it was uh, just reconfirmed that when our prime minister, and I have to say here, is the first, uh, first female uh, prime minister in the region, Iveta Radichova was here. She came uh, for an unofficial visit to the United States, but we combined it also with the conversation with the administration. She was awarded. Uh, as a strong leader in our country, uh, award by Glamour magazine, uh, which might be quite interesting for our female uh, representatives here, as a woman uh, of the year 2010, together with uh, Queen Rania, uh, together with uh, Cher, uh, together with uh, Julia Roberts and, and so on. So it was really like a continuation of a dream because I, I never could have imagined that we'll have a, a female leader, uh, first of all. And second, uh, we could not imagine that uh, a prime minister will come to New York, will be offered a red carpet and be among uh, the, the most important uh, celebrities and personalities awarded uh, this 
kind of prestigious uh, award, but uh, it's not about the beauty, it's about really uh, about her skills and uh, contribution to empowerment of uh, women. And uh, this was also confirmed uh, during her presentations in the New York Stock Exchange uh, in the discussion with the business community and also during uh, the Freedom Lecture, which is held every uh, every year, uh, and we alternate uh, with the Czechs uh, in Washington. There is uh, a Czech uh, leader speaking one year, Slovak leader second year. So I recommend you, uh, Woodrow Wilson has uh, this speech on uh, the, the web page, and uh, this is a much better presentation than myself. Uh, so I recommend that you you look at it and, and, and see uh, where also Slovakia has its own uh, priorities uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, just very briefly, I would like to mention uh, several priorities of our bilateral uh, relationship with the United States, and uh, uh, one of them is um, also to contribute to strengthening uh, transatlantic relations, uh, to relations between EU and US, to relations between NATO and uh, EU, because we believe that really we are the closest partners. We have uh, many uh, similar tasks. Uh, we are based on the same values, and this uh, transatlantic dialogue and uh, relationship cannot be replaced by some uh, temporary uh, priorities. That's why I believe also this summit, this upcoming weekend, should, should uh, deal with this issue uh, in a very deep manner and hope to uh, have some, some concrete results in spite of the difficulties we are facing on the discussion on several issues of the relationship between EU and NATO, but I do not think and do not see it as a natural that uh, these uh, two uh, organizations are not uh, working uh, together as, uh, as they should uh, and that some kind of bureaucratic restrictions and, and problems are uh, creating gap between those uh, two organizations because NATO is best designed to deliver on uh, hard security and um, EU has uh, really a unique uh, capacity to deliver on soft security measures and a civilian part and Afghanistan is a clear example of this kind of uh, uh, necessity of interaction between those two. But uh, due to the shortness of time, I was not able to touch on all the issues, uh, including the cooperation uh, in the economic area. We will have uh, uh, an important meeting in the Chamber of Commerce. I, I believe uh, Utah has uh, a great potential and Slovakia can uh, also provide something to uh, uh, develop uh, concrete ties in those areas like innovation, transfer of technologies. So I believe my visit here uh, is only a start of this uh, very product, uh, productive uh, dialogue. And last but not least, uh, the contact between the universities uh, and scientific institutions is something which I want to pursue very aggressively and uh, hopefully also meetings uh, today with your president and tomorrow uh, the meetings in uh, University of Utah will help me in, in this direction. So once again, thank you for your attention. Uh, as I mentioned, I was not able uh, comprehensively to deal with all the issues. That's why I was jumping from one subject to another. But I am open for any questions you might have. My name is my name is Taylor Williams. I'm an econ major. But what specific things did Slovakia do to uh, attract investment? Like Poland did shock therapy, where they uh, shocked their economy and got rid of all central planning. What what did Slovakia do to to enable the transformation? <coughs> Thank you for the question. Um, uh, 
Slovakia, uh, first of all, has created a very transparent legal system uh, for doing business in Slovakia. This is the, the first uh, prerequisite. Second prerequisite is, as I mentioned, skillful and quite uh, still affordable uh, labor force. Uh, we have introduced also a very flexible uh, labor code in Slovakia. We have introduced uh, also in the financial system something which uh, was never introduced before by almost anybody, uh, which was a flat tax, 19% uh, for everything. So uh, this uh, very transparent, clear uh, taxation system helped us a lot, I mean, to attract the investors. But uh, the government is also uh, uh, acting proactively. Uh, there are, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, major regional differences. Uh, Bratislava is, is much uh, uh, better off uh, than uh, the rest of Slovakia, and especially Eastern and Central Slovakia uh, needs uh, investments badly. That's why uh, the government uh, is offering incentives, uh, uh, including 50% uh, contribution to investors when they uh, want to establish a, a company uh, in uh, priority areas uh, for buying land, for buying uh, buildings, and, and, and so on. So it's quite a uh, significant uh, help uh, for a especially a small investor to come to Slovakia, invest with the support of the government. And finally, there are also industrial parks, uh, especially uh, this is important for uh, small investors. Uh, there are uh, uh, these this kind of facilities where uh, the investor uh, uh, can come and, and start the production uh, in, in, uh, basically immediately. And also the, the process of registration uh, in comparison with the past and in comparison also with some other countries is, is quite, quite flexible and, and quite quick. You need to have only five days for registering your business and uh, uh, start uh, doing business in Slovakia. Hi, my name is Brittany Hardy. I'm studying Eastern European history here. Um, I just had a question. You mentioned earlier on about Alexander Dubček. I was wondering if you could expand about his role in the de de democratizing process mm -hmm. in 1968-89 and how his effects have lasted now. You know, uh, it's also a story for uh, a separate lecture, but I will try to uh, uh, explain it briefly. Alexander Dubček believed that uh, uh, the socialist system uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, is uh, able to reform itself and uh, to, to uh, be uh, democratized, uh, which I think was a false uh, uh, presumption. And uh, he was building on it. Uh, uh, he also believed uh, that uh, in case uh, Czechoslovakia will decide to go uh, its uh, own uh, way in the area of democratization, that uh, the Soviet Union will not interfere. So there were some some um, uh, uh, some some mistakes in his thinking, which he was uh, really generally uh, thinking that uh, this might happen. Uh, so uh, he launched this process uh, um, in Czechoslovakia uh, in 1968, uh, and unfortunately it was uh, suppressed very quickly by uh, Soviet troops and Warsaw Pact troops. Uh, but he was very important in uh, the process uh, in 20 years, in 1989. He was a very uh, visible face. Uh, he was much more known than uh, President Havel at that time. Uh, and uh, people uh, trusted him, I mean, generally, uh, even those who uh, even supported uh, the communist uh, regime uh, trusted him uh, a lot. So he was able to attract the attention of uh, general people, and uh, that's why uh, you had uh, people, industries. Then, of course, uh, the cooperation with Va Václav Havel, who was a very important dissident, with uh, new ideas uh, which were not connected with the a reform of socialism, but uh, a radical change help us really to move out from uh, this uh, uh, system very, very quickly. Hi, my name is Reed, and uh, I was over in Salak for a couple of years, 
And when I was there, I um, met with a few college students, and they said a lot of highly educated college students would emigrate to um, other parts of Europe to, you know, for doctorate degrees and that kind of thing to earn money. Are you finding as the GDP increases that more Slovak graduates are staying home and beginning to find jobs in Slovakia? Or yes, um, basically, this is a natural process. Uh, Europe is open for uh, our citizens uh, to, to work and study uh, uh, or do business wherever they uh, want, uh, want and when uh, and wherever they decide. That's why many young people were using this opportunity, this possibility to go and, and find uh, jobs uh, elsewhere, uh, especially because of, uh, of, of the differences in, in salaries. But with the uh, GDP growth uh, and with the <coughs> progress in the reforms and more uh, foreign investors uh, and companies doing business in Slovakia, more and more uh, uh, students, uh, graduates are finding jobs in Slovakia, uh, especially now in the crisis, many people uh, again are returning back to Slovakia. It's contributing to increasing the uh, unemployment, but uh, at the same time, it's bringing uh, people already with experience to our economy, and I think uh, this will m help us to move faster in the uh, economic growth and economic transformation, which still it's not a finished job. Thank you. Hey, my name is Taylor. I'm studying economics. Uh, this might be a bit of a specific question, but as far as the development in Košice and Presho, um, the what give me any more, more specifics on the business incentives for investment there? Or where would I find those specifics? Uh, I will give it to you. <laughs> I will, uh, uh, for those who are interested, I, I, I have uh, uh, a brochure which is uh, Why Invest in Slovakia, and it's really very uh, uh, concise and very, uh, very good material for you to see uh, where there are in uh, incentives. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, burden the audience here, but uh, I will uh, give you uh, this brochure, and if you will be interested uh, about learning more, uh, then the embassy is here and uh, you can find us on the web page and uh, uh, we'll be able to provide you all the, all the details. But basic facts are, are here in, in why invest in Slovakia. I have also this brochure about research and development in Slovakia, which is one of the uh, priorities to encourage uh, uh, companies who wants to uh, uh, establish um, the research and development centers in Slovakia, what kind of investi uh, uh, in incentives are provided by the government. So. Oh, my name is Eric. I'm studying international relations. What is it that we as students at this university can do to best, I guess, improve relations between the United States and Slovakia? I think uh, just a very instant reaction. Uh, first of all, visit Slovakia and to, uh, to uh, learn by yourself uh, about Slovakia and to see really that it's a beautiful country with many opportunities. There are many of your colleagues now already uh, from United States doing business in, in Slovakia. This will be next area. And uh, of course, uh, you would also contribute to improving our language uh, uh, skills, uh, especially uh, managing English, uh, which is uh, a very important prerequisite for our young people to be able to communicate. It's it's growing, but still uh, uh, there is a necessity to uh, to expand the education in in English. Uh, uh, our current Minister of Education uh, has. Um, introduce a le legislation which will uh, make English uh, as a second language uh, in the uh, basic education. And uh, this is another opportunity. Uh, we would need uh, more teachers uh, of English in, in Slovakia. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm an international relations uh, major. Um, recently in the news, we saw that um, France was having some problems with their Roma population. I, I've lived in Slovakia. I know they have a large population. Are there any regulations that Slovakia is doing to help them or, or kind of control them? I don't know if you can say that. But just kind of what reforms are there for those yeah, people? Yeah. 
Uh, it's a very important question, and uh, it's one of the major uh, issues in, in Slovakia, but not only in Slovakia, but also in, in, in the region uh, of Central and uh, Eastern Europe, and now it's becoming a problem for the ho whole European Union. Um, during our existence uh, of 20 years, uh, we had many programs uh, trying to uh, integrate Roma, provide them better possibilities for education, for uh, employment, and, and so on. Uh, and in many ways, uh, we succeeded. There is a group of uh, Roma who are uh, very well integrated, educated, and so on. There is a second uh, group which voluntarily do not want to integrate. They have a uh, different approach to, to life. And there is a third group uh, which are very difficult to integrate because uh, of, um, of uh, lack of education and, and, and so on. So you need to have uh, different strategies in working uh, with those two, uh, three groups. Uh, and the current government wants to really have a comprehensive project based, uh, first of all, on the education. Because uh, to to uh, to break this uh, vicious circle of poverty of uh, Roma, and especially during the crisis, they are uh, the most vulnerable group. Uh, group, uh, uh, you you are facing additional uh, additional problems, and they are first to be uh, without jobs and, and and so on. That's why you need to increase the level of, of education. There are many projects in, in this area. We are also looking to experience from other countries, including the United States. Uh, this was also part of our discussion when our prime minister was here. And uh, we learned about uh, a project which is called uh, Harlem uh, Children uh, Zone. Uh, and it was based namely on the education, on really giving new opportunities uh, to African-American uh, children. And uh, I believe there are some similarities uh, in the problem of Roma and uh, uh, problem of integrating uh, some part of the African-American uh, population here in the United States. And uh, when we can benefit, we are really eager to learn more. So uh, uh, that's why we, we are looking the best advice, be best approaches, and best practices in, in this regard. Once again, thank you for your attention. And uh, once again, uh, if you need anything uh, uh, more uh, to learn about Slovakia, uh, you have the embassy here. We have uh, a consulate, uh, which is the closest one in uh, LA, but the embassy is, is best equipped, I mean, to give you any advice, any information you might need for your studies or uh, if you decide to travel to Slovakia. That's why. Uh, I believe you have to use this kind of uh, context. And once again, uh, I would like to uh, present you this, this publication. Uh